Good morning, HCC, and Happy New Year. You know, I can't think of another time in which people were so eager to be done with a year than 2020. The unprecedented misery of this past year has translated, I think, in some ways to what I observe as unprecedented hopefulness, wishful thinking, a desperate longing that the past is somehow now behind us and we have turned the proverbial page. Now, not to throw cold water into these rare moments of emotional respite for God knows we need it. The fact of the matter is there is nothing ontically different about a new year than the old. We are all we are all seasoned enough to know that this hopefulness of a new year, a sense of a reset is often fleeting. Gym memberships famously spike in January only to settle down just a few weeks later. We stumble in our resolutions and anxiety inducing news already fill the headlines. And soon we are reminded that January is just a way to describe the month that comes after December. Now, I know this feels like a dreadful way to start a first sermon of the new year, but I promise it will be a hopeful message, or at least I hope. For it is into this time that the church reminds us, as Jordan explained to us, that there is another calendar at play, that it isn't the turning of our annual calendar that somehow changes us or the numbers that are somehow more meaningful, but rather this other, a greater calendar of the spirit that carries us along into the story of God and enfolds our own personal timelines within it. So this Sunday, is not just the first Sunday of the new year, but it is even more significantly the second Sunday of the Christmas season. Meaning our texts are about what it means to live in the shock waves rippling out from the Christ birth. That means the question for us today as the people of God isn't so much, how do I strengthen my willpower in such a way that I can finally stick to my resolutions? Rather, our questions this morning are, what does it mean that Jesus is God with us? Or in the words of John 1, what does it mean that the Son of God has set up his tent in our neighborhood and dwells in our midst? When we turn to scriptures, it is clear that the Gospels are not interested in feeding the sentimentality that surrounds so much of our reading of Christmas. Whatever elements of birth story that may feel unreal, the virgin birth, the choir of angels, conversations with God and dreams, they are offset almost immediately by the very real earthly, earthy context of the fearful husband, of lowly shepherds, and incredibly human conversations. Indeed, our reading for this morning in Matthew chapter 2, in particular, sets the story in a distinctly ominous tone as it begins to describe the context like this, in the time of Herod. In the time of Herod, take any infamous tyrant's name and replace it with Herod, then you would begin to understand what this would feel like under Roman occupation, under the brutal rule of Herod, these were dark times. As Bishop Tom Wright comments, Jesus is born into a time of great darkness, the world in misery. If he is to be Emmanuel, God with us, he must be with us where the pain is. And that's what this chapter is about. In fact, 
If there's one thing chapter two of Matthew adds to the birth narrative is the sheer juxtaposition, a clashing of all of our neat categories that we love to keep separate between things spiritual and political, personal and public. These category, categories are broken apart and fused together for what enters into our idyllic image of the little town of Bethlehem is the violence of the earthly powers that would attempt to undo the incarnation. Yet it is also through the breaking of these images and these categories that the gospel is teaching us exactly the sort of Messiah, the sort of a king that this Christ will be. In one sense, the episode that we read for today in Matthew 2 is simply a continuation of the theme of recognition that pervades the Christmas story. What do you do when you realize, realize the incarnation is here? Mary responds by treasuring and pondering. The shepherds glorify and praise. But Herod and his advisory committee of religious sycophants, they too are recognizing the birth of the Messiah when they become troubled, it says, by this news. And they are right to be. Christmas tide might be the most political time of the Christian year. Matthew's narration certainly accentuates this aspect. There is no mention of a baby sleeping in heavenly peace, no description of the holy family in serene repose. Instead, the Gospel of Matthew immediately tells the story of a powerful king who trembles, shaking in his sandals terrified at the news of a baby born in a backwoods town. Even the joyous story of the adoration of the Magi is overshadowed by the hanging threat of an assassination. For in due course, Herod will order his troops to commit one of the most horrific acts described in the Bible, the slaughter of the innocents, all boy babies in and around Bethlehem slaughtered out of fear. For that's what Herods do when they fear their powers are threatened. They lash out in violence and in their desperate grasp of their fleeting power, they silence their enemies. Joseph, Mary, and this baby make a harrowing escape to Egypt. And when they return from Egypt, this place that has been a symbol of oppression in Israel's history now becomes a place of refuge from which will come forth the fulfillment of all humanity's hope. Out of, out of Egypt, I called my son, or as a pastor aptly translated, perhaps even more meaningfully for our times, out of Africa, I called my son. Jesus thus becomes a sort of a new Moses coming to rescue, to lead his people from the tyranny of all kingdoms and empires that seek to oppress and harass the weak and the marginalized and the powerless and lead them into the land of faithfulness. Can you hear what Matthew is claiming here? This baby who brings trouble to Herod and Herods, this baby who would bring Together, those whom Herod oppressed, this baby is coming to dismantle Herod's empire, brick by brick, stone by stone, without ever raising an army, swinging a sword, or firing a shot. His life of love will now judge 
and redeem and fulfill all who would kneel before him for the lowliest shepherds of Israel, for the Gentiles coming from foreign lands, and even hope for the Herods of this world. So at least in Matthew's telling of the Christmas story, one appropriate reaction to the coming of Christ is to tremble. For when God comes to us, there may be parts of our story that we will have to leave behind. There may very well be ways in which I will have attempted to hold on to my power and privilege and comfort to the detriment of others that is contradictory to the coming of Christ. And there will be ways in which the coming of Christ calls on me, calls on us to stand in solidarity with those being persecuted, oppressed, fleeing from Herod's who would seek to undo the message of the incarnation. This indeed is troubling news. And yet, this is precisely the good news that we need. For if there is any honest self-awareness within us, if we have undertaken any sort of self-assessment over this past year, and we've had plenty of time to do so, then I think we can agree that the darkness of 2020 will not dissipate, not by the turning of the calendar, nor by our resolve that we will somehow all be better people in 2021, but rather because we believe that the one who is light will eventually but surely prevail over all darkness. Because if 2020 taught us anything, is that we, if we have to rely on ourselves to make this work, 2021 is going to be another very difficult year. Stanley Hauerwas reminds us, Herods must be resisted, but we must also not forget that the fear that possessed Herod's life is not absent from our own lives. All Jerusalem was also frightened by the news of this child's birth. This is why it's so important that the church calendar today reminds us that we are part of another bigger story. And that is good news. So we ought to be more concerned about missing out on this story than of Herod's reprisals. That we ought to be more concerned about hearing and being part and being enveloped by this story than the fulfillment of our own kingdoms. How then do we cultivate this story, this understanding of reality in our lives? Our own Bishop Todd in last year's Tell Us Collective described something that has helped me think through this for the past several months. And he said, one of the key roles of a leader, and he was said this in the context of missional leadership, but it is clearly applicable to us all. But he said, one of the key roles for us is to reveal the life that Jesus is now living. To reveal the life that Jesus is now living. And what he means by this, he says, is that if we were to ask, if is Jesus alive, yes or no, we would all reply, yes, absolutely, no brainer. But while we get this at the doctrinal level, what we need to do is to bring it into the lived reality. That we wake up in the morning, Todd says, realizing that we are part of something that is already going on. That Jesus is already at work in the world because he is alive, leading and sustaining and guiding us toward the fulfillment of his mission of gathering all creation 
to the Father. He is alive and already at work. He is actually leading us daily in the countless ways like a teacher leads a disciple. Just to say, you are not alone. You are not living through this darkness on your own. It is not just up to your resolve to get up tomorrow and make it to the end of the day. You are not left to your own powers, your wits, your cleverness to get you and others through this darkness. But you will make it because you are with the living Jesus. Jesus is alive and present with us. And this is our story. And this is our confidence. And this is our peace. So to quote another commentator, thank you, Herod, for reminding us without intending to do so that the baby at Bethlehem is not only the gift, joy, and a joy, but also a threat. And teach us, Matthew, again to tremble before the one who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the one who shall reign forever and ever. Amen.